Well, gear up indeed. Thanks, friend. Thanks for joining. Welcome to the show, everybody. Remember, this is your show as much as it is mine, so please participate. Ask questions. Get involved. Thumbs up if you like it. Share. Invite friends in while we talk. This is going to be a fun one. My guest today has been an experimental test pilot for nearly four decades. He's an A1 category fighter instructor. He flew in the South African Air Force, the Silver Falcons display team. He was the chief test pilot of the South African Air Force, the officer commanding of the Test Flying and Development Center, the general officer commanding of Air Force Base Mercado, the fighter base of the Air Force, and retired as the chief of air staff operations after more than 40 years service in the South African Air Force. His family is littered with pilots and the, the, the Barker family is known around the world. He's an honorary fellow in the Royal Aeronautical Society, an author of several books and currently penning his fourth. He has many, many different publications. He's been in, created and led high performance teams throughout his illustrious career. Major General Des Barker is on the show today. My name is Alex McPhail and this is High Performance Teams. Please stay with me. General, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Alex, good afternoon. It's been a long time. <laughs> it has indeed. Are you keeping well in this freezing high felt? I'm very well. I'm kitted out in my baby grow for uh, immersion in cold waters if necessary. Oh, wonderful. I, I, you did note earlier that you do not have your G-suit on. I'll try not to pull you through the paces and that's a good thing. <laughs> no, no problem at all. I can still handle plus seven, minus three. Okay, wonderful. So let's start at the beginning, General. Uh, a lot of people know you in all sorts of circles all around the world, most notably in experimental test flight and in air shows and air show um, accidents and air show safety, etc. But let's go back to sort of formative years and your days growing up as a youth and the, the times that you were exposed to aviation. I'm going to put a picture up here and you can just talk about your sort of parents and grandparents era of flying and, and how that was exposed to you. Okay, this is rather unique in that uh, my blood is blue, not because of my royal lineage of any sort, and not because I'm a Blue Bull supporter, but rather because it's Air Force Blue. That guy there in the middle is my grandfather. He was the 22nd member of the South African Air Force. And I've tried to trace his, his past, and what is interesting was that he fought in the Anglo-Boer War as a member of the Irish Constabulary. Okay. And at 1902, when he returned back to the UK, the next time I pick up on him, he's serving in the South African 7th Inf Infantry, and he's gone off to German East Africa to fight in the First World War. He then returned at, in 1918, and what I presume happened was that he joined in 1920, uh, at the end of 1920, as the 22nd member of the Air Force at the age of 40. Wow. Okay. So when, I, I suspect that when Pierre van Reinefeldt was given the task by Field Marshal Jan Smuts to establish the Air Force, that they needed to find people from the military to establish at least the basics. So he was the head of the uh, motor section as well as airfield or uh, airfield security at Swatops. This was in 1921. And then he retired in 1939 at the start of the First World War. And of course, he, he would have lived in Roberts Heights, there where Valhalla is. And he had four sons and uh, three of them left school immediately and joined the Air Force and went into war. Uh, the fourth one was a little bit younger and had to hang on a bit, but that was the guy you guys know, Dougie Barker and his son Mark. Okay. So, so I come out of an Air Force family. I grew up in Roberts Heights on downwind for SWAT Corps. And when that is my father, he served at uh, three squadron in Italy. And then he went uh, for 17 months to Korea, where he was with two squadron. So we then I moved, we moved from Roberts Heights. We moved then through to Waterkloof Air Force Base. And I grew up on the base, on the base. <laughs> <laughs> uh, adjacent to the threshold of runway 19, I am told that my mother never had uh, sufficient milk for me. She produced only after. So <laughs> I was weaned on, on after. Now, if you go up to Waterkloof, you'll see the distance between our house and the threshold was no more than about a thousand meters. 
So I was exposed to aviation like you cannot believe. Sabres, vampires. I saw the first C-130s arrive. I saw the Mirage 3s being uh, reassembled in their crates and sneaked out in the late afternoons for high-speed taxi tests. Uh, there was no other alternative for me. I was bathed. I was uh, totally uh, caught up in aviation. I built models. I flew airplanes. I used, you know, there were no fences around the air bases in the earlier years. And you could walk to the air traffic control tower, pay two and a half shillings on a Saturday morning, and then go for a flip in the back of a Dakota while these old hands were doing instrument flying. So sonic booms, when the Mirage 3s came in, you know, there were no regulations prohibiting high-speed flight. So I would get home from school and find the windows shattered or these light bulbs all lying on the floor because the guys came across the runway at about 1.05, 1.06, and they caused havoc. In the Pretoria news and the local newspapers, there were regular complaints about the damage being caused. And of course, then what they did is that they uh, brought in regulations and cut all of this down to size. Wow. Okay, look, uh, you've, you've spoken about so many fascinating things there. Uh, I mean, being born and grown up on an Air Force base, it just sounds like, uh, I mean, you, you're destined to fly. But not only that, is that you had a head start on a whole bunch of people because it's in your blood, it's in your family, but you've seen it from a youth. And, uh, and did you go straight from finishing school into the Air Force then? Correct. Um, I went to, you know, uh, I, there was no other alternative. There was never another thought in my mind I was going to go into the Air Force. And uh, I went on to pubes course two of 68. I was one part of the guinea pigs that were sent uh, straight onto jets in the time that air forces around the world were interrogating the, the philosophy of uh, straight basic training on jets. And uh, I found myself down at Langebaanweg uh, flying in parlors as a young, not so hot to trot. <laughs> <laughs> pilot. <laughs> okay, all right. So the jet line it was, you've been uh, inculcated in the jet line as a youth and, and you, you start training on jets and you continue on and uh, uh, just for the sake of uh, getting to the, the meat of the conversation, you become a fighter instructor and at the same time, uh, I'm going to put up some pictures, you have a tour on vampires and, uh, and, and then later on to silver falcons as well. So, so there's a picture of you in your, uh, in your position. I think you were number two in the Falcons in 1975. So tell me about your time in the Falcons and the display team. Um, it was also very interesting in that you, during the, you weren't born yet, but by, in the <laughs> 1970s, about I guess, 72 to 74, there was an international embargo on fuel. There was a huge fuel shortage. You couldn't buy more than 20 liters at a time. And the Solar Falcons actually came to a, a halt. And we, uh, in 1975, for the first time, there was going to be the reformation of the Solar Falcons. So we had to begin from first principles, developing the different maneuvers uh, with guys that had never done this before. Obviously, we had some of the old hands that we cross-referenced with to just check on speeds, heights, and uh, whatever the case, uh, the information that we needed. Mm -hmm. So this team was the first team after the fuel embargo, and this is the team that opened the uh, Air Africa Expo at Lanseria in September 1975, operating out of Waterkloof. Okay, well, nice. Now, was that a... Was that a um uh, a time that you were able then to flourish because there'd been this pause where you given extra impetus to go and more budget and more air shows or was it a, a slowly trickle in back into the market? No, we were given the go ahead full steam ahead already at about March of the year. They said, right, get going. We, uh, the Air Force is back in the swing of things. But you must remember in those days, there weren't the air shows like you have today, the number of air shows. There would be two or three air shows at most during the year. Okay. So there wasn't that much exposure. Okay, all right. Well, that seems to be a thing that kind of over the years, there's always a, the, the various teams and, and members will chat and say, you know, in our time, we had this, we had this pause, there was no fuel, there was no hours, but, but you really were reforming from the beginning. So a, a nice exposure to sort of high performance teams and, and getting stuck in, but, you know, building it from the ground up must have been quite an interesting challenge. And, uh, and I imagine lots of building blocks need to be put in place, lots of, uh, lots of planning, lots of debriefing. If you want to just, just take a moment and share the kind of debriefing and, and how you'd go about making sure that this show is safe, looks good, and, uh, and it is suitable to be an Air Force show. 
Well, first of all, it was the shifting process to get the right guys on the team that wanted to fly. You needed to have the passion. It was a voluntary service that you could undertake. And then each of, and this was a principle that I applied for the rest of my, my career, of course, was using a build-up process. And then we had, once again, before you were born, a thing called <laughs> a uh, wingman's contract in which the two most important considerations in wingman's contract is the trust, the trust that your, the guys in the team would do their best. You wouldn't have to worry about them. They, the capabilities and the abilities of each of the players in the team had to match and give synergy or else you were going to write somebody off. So there was the, the capability, there was the trust, and then, of course, a very important factor is the vulnerability aspect. To understand that we as humans can make a mistake and that we have to be looking out for each other uh, in the event that something should go wrong. So those were the two key uh, drivers that, on which we built the team, was okay. uh, the trust and the uh, vulnerability aspects. And that's what's called a wingman's contract. Okay, well, that sounds interesting. And I'm sure then that, that principle, you'd be building on it and using it later in your career. But um, so, so you carry on through the, the fast jet line after your time instructing. I'm just going to put some pictures up as we talk. Um, okay. And here's a story, as, uh, is it the Mirage 3, where you talked about newspaper featuring in the newspaper. Is this you featuring in the newspaper or, uh, or wingman at the squad? No, it's me featuring <laughs> in the front seat and a navigator by the name of Liu Teron in the back. I was the project test pilot for the Cheetahs. Uh, this was, you had to establish a baseline, a performance baseline before we modified the aircraft. And to do this, we had to do Mach 2 runs. Okay. The only place we could do them uh, close to Waterkloof was to go down to the coast and operate off the, the Natal South Coast, KwaZulu Natal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the typical profile would be to dry climb up to 36,000 feet and then accelerate to 600 knots and then do a cruise climb up to Mach 2, which you'd hit at about 48,000 feet. Now, the year was about, um, I think, 1986. It was a time of, of political turmoil in the country and uh, bomb blasts were quite common and in the KwaZulu-Natal area there was a lot of strife and regular r reports of bombs being detonated. So you've got to picture this. We arrive down there in this aircraft, we get airborne and we run down the Natal south coast yeah. at Mach 2, <laughs> dragging along with us this Mach 2 shockwave. Uh, to about 20 miles south of uh, the Louis Buerta airport and then we land and I am pretty impressed because as we taxing in the base commander was a Colonel Philip Prinsloo mm -hmm. and an entourage of cars behind him including several police vehicles and I thought oh, this, is, we, we, this is not too bad until I, I opened the canopy, and before the ground crew could put in the ejection seat pins, the OC of the base was at the top of the ladder and <laughs> spitting fire. <laughs> because of the alert state in KwaZulu-Natal, people all along the coast reported bomb blasts. And in the police joint operation center, they couldn't fathom out, this is the end of the world. Bombs are going off all along the coast. Until some wise policeman down in the Joint Operations Centre said, the rate at which these calls are coming in, this can't be bombs. It can only be a shockwave. And they managed to uh, fathom this out, reported this, and by the time we'd landed, the cops were there. Luckily, they didn't uh, cart us off. <laughs> so you thought you were getting such a welcome uh, response to your testing yep. trial, and everyone was so impressed with you, and meanwhile... <laughs> Okay, that's an interesting story, but we've now jumped ahead a little bit. I just want to back up a bit just to set the rest of the scene. So, um, 10 years on from flying in air shows, etc., and fighter instruction, um, you are then involved in maintenance test flying and then get selected to do experimental test pilots course in uh, the United States. So, uh, just briefly, just talk through that experience and then actually want to come to the main point of being the okay. test pilot in the South African Air Force. 
Okay, so while I was at Langebaan, I did the maintenance test pilots course, the same course that you basically did at TFDC, but the, this one was three months long and consisted of a, a lot of flying uh, besides the theory. And after that, they invited me to take a posting to headquarters to be deployed to the UK on, uh, at the Empire Test Pilot School. But the arms embargo was in place and year in, year out, I was left to work at uh, Donnell as the production acceptance test pilot on the Impalas and then the famous Kudu. So I, you know, every year my boss would come to me and say, listen, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're not going to the UK because of this uh, political embargo. So there was no ways I was going anywhere. And then one day, I walked down the passage in that mighty headquarters mm -hmm. and uh, the senior staff officer operations, who happened to be the Silver Falcons leader, yeah. said to me, listen, I believe you're not going to go now and not in the, the short term either. I would like to offer you a posting to 12 Squadron. Okay. We're looking for pilots. That That's Canberra, is that? On the Canberra. Canberra. Yep. We're looking for pilots that are prepared to operate on their own, miles away from nowhere <laughs> with no protection, uh, <laughs> and do the necessary strategic photography that we needed. He said, I guarantee you job satisfaction <laughs> like you will never, ever have. So I accepted his invitation and spent five years at uh, 12 Squadron. Uh, that alone is a story on its own, the places I've been and seen alone, with just the intelligent conversation of a navigator to keep you going. Okay, so then you mentioned that uh, you were an escort on the 12, we, uh, just to fast forward to, to this particular mission, you shared the picture, this is, uh, you can talk us through the, the gun film here, you're on an okay. escort patrol with the Canberra's in the bush, and uh, this is okay. the famous JJ ranking shot. Yeah, um, I was... Uh, the, the problem with the, the bush war was that the response times of the Angolan Air Force was improving. So we needed to find ways to get in, take the, the film, and get the hell out of Dodge. And in this particular case, we'd run in low level, and we were now flying in pairs. So instead of one Canberra doing the photographic reconnaissance, we would do them line abreast. And we would call it a small area coverage, and we would run in and turn a very big, wide formation and uh, get the, the footage and, and get out. And in this particular case, these guys were waiting for us, and uh, we had an escort. We had two F1 escorts. The, in this case here was Johan Renken and Kurbis Turin, who you know. Yeah. And uh, the... Hostile bandits were identified by Dayton, the radar, and we were immediately, we just plunged. We used to uh, hit point eight five with air brakes out and then hit the deck and then run uh, as fast as our little wings could carry <laughs> us, leaving the fight here to Johan Rankin and to Quibus Turin. Okay, right. And so this is just so, <laughs> he sent me, Johan Rankin actually just sent me this picture autographed and said, thank you to the bait. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it okay well it's just impressive to be able to see actual gun footage of a kill and it's uh, a very common footage that yeah it's, it's uh, out there okay so um uh, i want to get to the, the test flying so general then you uh, you end up going on the test pilots course ultimately and uh ending up at uh, tfdc is your posting straight back to tfdc i go to tfdc and i spend the next 17 years at tfdc uh I can tell you that outside of actual combat flying, there's no other flying that can give you the adrenaline rush that uh, test flying can. Every flight is different. Every flight has its own particular challenges. And uh, if you can come out of there unscathed at the end of the day, well, good luck to you. But only by the good Lord's blessings uh, that I'm still here. There were many cases where I shouldn't have been here, made many, many mistakes. And I just happened to be on the right side of the receiving end. But in theory, uh, you're working in, in, in a, a hazardous environment in which you're working in the field of the unknown unknowns. It's the area of discovery. And you don't have all the tools, even today, the fidelity and the integrity of the modeling and simulation is not good enough. 
you've got to go to flight test. You cannot do everything in wind tunnels, in experimental, sure. and then go and uh, sign off that the product is good to go. Okay, well, you've you shared lots of pictures, so let's just talk through some of the pictures then okay. of, of the type of work that you would have been doing then. Um, okay. So here's a, uh, uh, this is probably not in the correct order, but let's talk about just some big things like an engine change. Uh, so that was your first flight there. An engine change, you had uh, Mirage. Uh, okay, well, there's, you can talk about that while I look for the next picture. Okay, that's the first flight on the Cheetah Sea. I was the project test pilot on the Cheetah Sea, and it's a custom in the Air Force. You get the ice bath afterwards. I'm not a happy camper at this stage <laughs> because I didn't think it's necessary. Um, <laughs> you on your first solo <laughs> at flying school, yes, maybe. But for this, now my gloves are wet, the boots are wet, the G-suit is wet, everything is wet. <laughs> not necessary. And you're not at the squadron anymore. You're now uh, doing test flying, etc. Correct. So, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so there's just some pictures that I'm putting up and you can talk through any of them that you that you think is applicable. For, okay, for there's major a high-speed target drone. Okay. I was involved with a lot of uh, weapons clearance work. Uh, you must remember where we came from. We had the bush war. We had an arms embargo. We had a defense industry that sprung up overnight. Engineers all over were putting together devious uh, weaponry and uh, our job at the flight test center was to test them and that there is a high-speed target drone it goes at uh, one million rand a shot so you're referring to this this picture here saying you shot yep. one yeah okay yep. and and then yeah, i'll put a, the i'll put the picture four. up there okay <laughs> so there's the kill of the high-speed target drone so this is a million rand item and, and what is its purpose well it's it serves as a target for the missile but you must remember that the word is missile not a hitile okay. so the engineers on the ground at Kentron are not happy because they have now uh, taken out their high speed target drone which was supposed the missile was supposed to go past and the proximity fuse would be ignited uh, and then they would recover the drone and then you reuse the drone now, unfortunately, in this case, this was a Cat 5. It was going nowhere. <laughs> but in some sense, uh, it's also a sign of the, the, the level of perfection or the level of ingenuity that's gone into it that it, uh, although designed to miss, the target was so accurate that it actually hit. So is this, a, is this a good thing to show that the capability is good or is it a bad thing because it was uh, too accurate or, or a little bit off course? Well, it's a, it's a good thing because what you've got now is not a missile but a hitile. So you actually have a very, very smart bullet. So normally with a bullet, the bullet can't maneuver. Now with the uh, missile, you've got a smart bullet which actually tracks your target and gives you a better chance of the kill. Okay. Uh, you need to understand how technology has advanced. It's incredible. The sensor capabilities of modern missiles and if you're going to be a fighter pilot today, I remember in 2006 you told me you're a closet fighter pilot and that you want to fly fighters. I want to tell you what, you must make sure that your will is well up to date and that there's somebody to take over your car, your wife or your girlfriend, dogs and cats, because he with the best technology is going to win the, the battle. This sounds a bit like a, a Formula One race. You know, the more money and the more, better technology, the, the better you're going to do. Ex exactly. So you're saying the days of 1v1 are over? Uh, long ago. We're at uh, fifth generation missiles, we're at uh, fourth generation air combat tactics. Uh, the whole secret is to first detection and first launch. And then after that, those survivors that merge will then be pulled into a, a dogfight. How many are going to survive? I'm not quite sure. Okay. So it's a, an issue of counters and countermeasures at all levels, electronics as well as in the weapons field. Okay, so you spent more than a decade, close to two decades, doing testing in the Air Force, but you were the chief test pilot at TFDC for a while, also the officer commanding, and you continue to do testing and, and, and supersonic flight for the rest of your career, just about. Um, at the time, you were uh, a, a visiting lecturer or doing testing while I did my ot &E course there, and I presented to you, and we flew your 3,000th hour together on the uh, Impala. Uh, was there anything special for you about the Impala? Is there anything you want to talk about there? Are you wanting me to tell anybody about your lecture that you gave? <laughs> no, let's skip Not. past that one. We can skip past that. <laughs> um, the Impala, if you want to talk about the Impala, you can talk about the age-old uh, debate between uh, fixed-wing uh, guys on helicopters, uh, 
Harvards and Impalas, where everybody would say for the Impala, you never be able to fly a, a tail dragger and a proper aircraft, and, and you'll never be a good pilot unless you've passed through Harvards. Well, I had the opportunity to fly both as an instructor, and once again, I w what was confirmed to me was the, the human physiology, how we are able to compensate Whenever there are challenges thrown at us, we will compensate. So there were guys that were trained on Impalas that went to fly helicopters. There were guys on Harvards that came to fly Mirages. It didn't really matter. You as the human are more than able to learn to compensate for the various uh, stability and control and performance aspects of any aircraft that you presented with. Okay, now some of the, the, the points you put together, a presentation and you've got these key principles, was that at a time where you were in, involved in the testing at TFTC? Uh, one of the principles that stands out in your last answer was number five, systematic training to allow you to conduct good debriefs to find the latent errors and results in learning. Okay, so th this is very important. I know that your focus area, uh, you keep on telling me, is high performance teams. Mm. My focus area is a highly reliable organization. It doesn't matter if you have a thousand high performance teams. Yeah. If within that organization there is not synergy and those teams are all working in accordance with a common uh, and coherent vision, and it has to start right at the top with management. If you don't have that, you can have all the high performance teams in the world, your, your system will not operate. And in flight test, it's even more important. So I used to focus on things like commitment to resilience. Your organization needs to understand that things are never going to always run smoothly. Sure. When things don't run smoothly, you cannot afford to sit in the corner and blab. You've got to stand up, you've got to fight back, you've got to take the lessons learned and recycle them in this education loop. You've got to operate in a field of teamwork and this is where your high performance teams come in and at TFTC and all flight test organizations around the world the <clears throat> high performance teams in flight testing each guy once again that contract I spoke about the wingman's contract applies to that whole team and at TFTC we used to apply this and the test team wasn't just the pilot and the engineer and data acquisition and telemetry it's everybody no matter who or what that served on your team had an equal opportunity to make input, to bring their experience, because we had what is called deference to expertise. Mm. That's and your principle you number six. Great. I like that. Yeah. So in any organization, you can't appoint me as a head of a neurosurgery. Mm. I mean, nobody would survive that. <laughs> Just as you can't have a non-test pilot running a flight test team. He has to come out of that milieu to know what lessons have been learned. How do I avoid these things in the past? And this is why we used to have a, these set of regulations. Things like reluctance to simplify. We could never just simplify. And people didn't always used to understand this within the Air Force. It was the level down to which we would research any issues. We would look at experimental methods like wind tunnels. We would look at uh, modeling and simulation. We needed, remember we were working in the area, in the domain of uncertainty. Sure. We couldn't afford to just get airborne. I went to fly MiG-29s in Russia and the Russian flight test center in Vladimirovka has a memorial to the fallen test pilots. There were 720 memorial yeah. plaques there. Wow. But they did everything by first principles, and it didn't matter. They learned, and if they lost a test pilot along the way, so be it, they were more lined up to come and do this. Sure. So we, we did an evaluation on the MiG-29 to have a look whether we could actually buy MiG-29s for our Air Force instead of Gripen, Okay. And transition straight from a PC-7 Astra into MiG-29. Uh, so <laughs> wow. part of my... <laughs> that would be incredible. These are things you don't know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so my job was to have a look at what is the step, uh, jump, 
in handling skills to go from an Astra to a MiG-29. Okay. So we spent time, and then of course we fitted that engine to the uh, Mirage F1 and the Cheetah. Okay, was that the, the 9K50? Yeah, uh, no, it's the SMR95, okay. which is the Russian MiG-29 engine. It's actually an RD-33. We put into the Mirage F1, despite Dasso saying this can never happen. It's never going to fit. But the <laughs> South African engineers, they made it fit. Okay, well, while you talk about that, let's just put a little bit of uh, media up because uh, there's some information coming up here. Oh, that doesn't want to play. Let's try this one. Um, Missile testing, see if that one, oh, that one also doesn't apply. Okay, so I'm having trouble with the media there, but you spoke about the complexity and are not able to test. So here's a picture that you shared and where we can speak about complexity and you can't plan for everything. Now here's, was it 10 different uh, parachute bombs, retard bombs uh, delivered from one platform? All right, so in the 80s, uh, if you think of some of the, the Arab-Israeli wars and things like that, the way to penetrate into the target area without getting taken out by SAM 2, 3, 6, etc., was to run in at 50 foot, 550 knots, okay. and then release the weapon. So the Americans designed, I uh, can't remember, the BABLU 100, I think, a uh, retarder weapon where once you've released the bomb, behind the bomb, these paddles would open, and they would decelerate the bomb so that you could continue and you leave the bomb behind. Okay. The South African engineer said, man, we can save a huge amount of weight. We don't put metal paddles and all the complexities of these blades opening. Mm -hmm. We do it with a, we de do the deceleration with a uh, parachute. Uh, we had to clear these parachutes to 600 knots. Nowhere in the world do I know of parachutes having been <laughs> cleared to 600 knots. Sure. That's frightening. That is fast. Wow. Of, of course, there were failures of parachutes. Mm -hmm. Some of them skipped. And the, the range officer, if you released this and the parachute didn't open immediately, they would just call pull. And then I'd have to pull. And this, these 250-kilogram uh, bombs would go screaming off to the northern hemisphere somewhere. Okay. In, 2,000 years' time, archaeologists will be digging around there, <laughs> and they will find big blobs of metal and wonder what the hell were these people doing at that time. <laughs> so, wow. in this particular picture, this was the clearance of the 10-bomb configuration with a minimum time interval. That's about 0.2 of a second. The ride was one of the roughest I've ever had in my life in that every 0.2 of a second – a bomb, a 250-kilogram bomb, is coming off the aircraft. It's being uh, pushed off with the explosives, and it shifts between the back and the front, the back and the front, all of this to keep the center of gravity of the aircraft uh, in the static mar within the static margin. And I want to tell you the ride in that flight was one of the roughest I had. I was doing plus two and a half and minus two and a half every 0.2 of a second just about as yeah. this thing was going. I didn't dare touch the control column. I just held it. Because if I tried to intervene and try to stop this, I would have created a PIO and broken that aircraft up. Okay, so just, uh, just for clarity, there's a pilot-induced oscillation. you trying to make an input to correct it. By the time your input comes, the correction's already changed again, and you're actually making it worse. But that's yeah. an interesting talking point here, General, is that um, never mind the fact that uh, to fly a Delta Wing fast jet is one thing. I can remember some of my friends in the Air Force, you know, mm. almost uh, going to say thank you, touching the nose of this aircraft when they've landed safely back after another flight in a Delta Wing. Never mind the fact that you become a test pilot on these things and perhaps you fly them infrequently, but you're still required to do the work. But then experimenting with different hard points, different weaponry, different missiles, how do they fly? And then how do they deliver and how do they launch? It must have been one amazing ride, just being a part of this. As I mentioned to you, it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> and with these bombs here is where I came close, the closest I've had, a, uh, what do you call it, a near-death experience. Yeah where the, the bomb on the outside, on the outer wing station, the parachute opened up on the aircraft while it was still suspended to the Ugh. aircraft at 550 knots at 300 foot. <clears throat> Luckily, it was on the outboard wing station and it started to corkscrew 
and it corkscrewed the nose away from the ground and I was stuck in the top of the canopy at minus four and a half G and I could not get out of the aircraft. I was trying to get my hands onto a, an ejection lever, but I couldn't because of the G. And uh, as the speed decelerated, because one of these parachutes were open, I was able to, I had no idea what was going on. One second I was flying along at 550 knots, and the next second this aircraft just went completely haywire. And I managed, as the speed came down, to hit the all jet uh, push button okay. and jettisoned eight bombs and two drop tanks into the ocean. Um, and then try to work out what the hell had happened. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. so, the air, so the aircraft, what was interesting, and which if you have pilots that listen to your show, was that when you have a near-death experience, if you haven't had one, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you're having it, things slow down. Yes. You think so clearly, mm -hmm. and you're definitely not afraid. You have a complete feel for, and you understand exactly what's going on around you, and it gives you a huge amount of time to plot and plan the next actions that you're going to take. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll digress a little bit, and we'll get back into the, the meat of our conversation of engaging okay. some public speaking. And uh, and one of the stories I like to share is that there's a story of a famous uh, um, uh, mishap in the operating theatre where these doctors were trying to, to do a routine operation, but it was still at the intubation phase where the patient was make, being made ready for the, the procedure. And, yeah. uh, and the, the, the temporal distortion on the other ex, uh, end of the scale, such that 20 minutes had passed by, and when they called time on this operation, that uh, things had finally, uh, in inverted commas, settled down. The patient later didn't make it, but when they thought they had got on top of this thing, the doctors could not believe that that was the real time, and they were confused yeah. along the way. People trying to give them cues that say, "Listen, this much time has passed," and they they didn't understand. It felt like it was yeah. just a matter of seconds. And then contrasting that, I can remember as a pupil, one of my instructors describing his ejection in Impala, you know, high-level ejection, premeditated, knowing he wasn't going to get anywhere, and describing the, the 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 tug of the the drogue going out, and describing the shards of glass, yeah. and feeling all the stuff, and all this happened in a second. And just the contrast of those two things, this temporal distortion, it's amazing how you have this ability to, to slow everything down and make calculated decisions as you were describing a moment ago. Yeah, uh, I think the bottom line is that when you know you're going to die, you're not afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, b before the time you might be, but once you know, and I often think about this during the, the world wars, uh, these guys that were sent out into battle, uh, in really lousy conditions. You know, we complain today if you don't have a flat screen and you don't have an electronic this and an electronic bag, sure. then you're, you're nothing. You, you don't want to do anything. Those yeah. guys flew in horrendous conditions uh, and they must have experienced every night lying in bed wondering whether they're going to come back tomorrow morning. Mm. Great respect. Yeah. Uh, I spent, I spent uh, three years as the air attaché in London and I... My, I had a, a, it was a mind-blowing experience to mix with the guys that flew in the Battle of Britain. I went to dinners with them. I laid more wreaths in a year than many people in their whole lifetime. 26, 28 wreaths at commemoration of all these different uh, battles and Air Force campaigns during the uh, Second World War. Amazing to meet these people and to let them tell you what it was like. Yeah, that must have been an incredible, uh, incredible time, yeah. Um, it, it, okay, so I want to just jump into the, uh, some of the specifics of being part of the TFTC and, uh, and uh, evaluation. So there's another aspect to this where you, as you discussed, the MiG-29 as an option. Um, it would have been incredible. W was there going to be, um, obviously, some sort of bridging program to go from an Astra to a MiG-29? I mean, why is, why is it that not was the case? Idea. Why don't we go straight to the Gripen now? I mean, is it so different to a MiG-29? No. You've got to understand to get to the fighter pilot level, you've still got to go through the, the training part, sure. the air to ground. You're teaching the guy battle formation. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to teach him air to ground, air to air, all these things, bombs, rockets. Uh, and if you downscale all those costs to a, a MiG, okay. it's better to do it on a three-tier system, Astra, Hawk, and Gripen. Okay. Uh, it's, you can do it. Sure. You can take a guy from the Astra and put him into MiG-29. It's just that the gap in terms of air combat skills and experience mm. to make up those hours is going to cost you a lot of money. A lot of money in an expensive aircraft. Well, here's an, an aircraft that we both flew. 
The, so the C47 TP, I never flew this particular one, and uh, I know there was something funny, well not funny, but there was there was interesting characteristics about this test bed, this DAC, uh, the turbo DAC at TFTC. I remember George Miller telling me about uh, trying to get this lateral, uh, you know, the, what is the, 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 they call it the vomit comet, you know, this lateral instability, the Dutch roll. It, what is your what is your memories of of spending time in this machine? I remember this machine very well because this is the maritime version of the C forty seven. You'll see the nose has a laser ball. Uh, it's got a and also the nose there has a probe on a flight test probe. But what you can't see if you look just below the the wing uh, of where the observer's window is. Mm -hmm. The observer's window. You'll see just below there is a radome. Okay, I see this that, was, yeah. This was to replace the Shackleton. This was going sure. to be the radome. And a very expensive and very capable radar was put into that radome. Now, look at where it's positioned. Mm -hmm. You now have a five-bladed turboprop with a huge increase in mass flow. And there's a lot of swirl that takes place. That radome is aft of the aircraft CG. When you put the flaps down, the airflow is deflected and the combination of the deflection as well as the side wash then impinged on the radome, creating another rudder. Uh. So the aircraft would yaw without any rudder, uh, if I remember correctly, at yawed left. So the minute you put the flap down, the aircraft started to your left and you couldn't, there wasn't enough aileron to, uh, to stop it and not enough rudder to stop it. Okay. What the result is we could turn through 360 degrees, your the aircraft through 360 <laughs> degrees without any rudder application. Yeah. Okay. So I refuse to sign off on this, uh, much to everybody's uh, dismay, but you couldn't afford to have an aircraft like this in the event that you lost the left-hand engine. Mm. Then it'll be, yeah, it'll be just be a had, nightmare, handful. It would be a handful, it would be a nightmare. And so the suggestion was, strap the flaps up and never allow the flaps to be used because while the flaps were attracted, this phenomenon was not present. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if that is the, the best way forward either. Um, I ended up flying the turbo deck, but obviously without that radome, uh, we had quite a very, very basic uh, radar used for the, the sort of ship tracking, etc. But yeah. uh, the, no, the, the TP deck did operate quite well. Um, but, but being part of that uh, unit at TFTC, you get to fly all sorts of di different things and evaluate uh, different aircraft. And uh, you were part of the, and was this L159 uh, a possibility instead of the Hawk? Is that where this so, fits in? Okay, so the replacement program, uh, the, the competition was between the Hawk, uh, the, the Hawk 100, the L159 from Erevoda Khodi, and uh, the Air Maki 339, I think it was, and also the Yak uh, 346, I think it was. Oh, lovely aircraft. All of them, and mm. all of them were hugely capable and would have solved the Air Force's problem for them of a replacement for the Impala, but the Hawk, and this is the Erevoda Khodi team, this was done in, in uh, Czech Republic, and uh, the aircraft itself, magnificent uh, Westinghouse, Allied Westinghouse engine, and a, uh, a modern uh, Navitech system. The problem with this was it was a straight wing aircraft, and at 0.75 or 0.76, the air brake comes out immediately to slow you down. Okay. We don't want to slow down, you know, in the in fighter <laughs> world, there's only one speed, and that's full speed. <laughs> now, we flew this plus the Hawk, and then also the 339. And the Hawk had six and a half thousand pounds of thrust, swept back wing. And although its turning performance was not as spectacular, for our Hawk, it was fitted with leading edge slats, some droop, to increase the lift of the wing itself to give you better turning performance for the fight. Okay. And did the Hawk turn out to be, I mean, I know there's lots of different decisions. Was it the best bet anyway, or does it come down to what is the best for the government with the, you know, the whole deal? I mean, I'm not getting into political things, but, but is it, well, there's three that are quite good and they, they must choose the best, or was this the best aircraft, the Hawk? 
it was for South African conditions. You'll know as well as I the hot and high density altitude conditions that we experience in Africa. For so many years, we had to offload fuel or we had to offload weapons to mm. beat the temperatures and the density altitudes. I, Me personally, it wasn't my decision, but I was in favor of any aircraft that would give us six and a half thousand pounds of thrust. It's a... Uh, an uh, Impala was uh, three and a half thousand pounds, if I remember correctly, uh, a mm. Mark II. Uh, three and a half thousand pounds is nothing in these uh, high density altitudes that we experience. Okay, you talked about offloading weapons, so let's uh, let's let's talk weapons for a little bit again. Um, there's a loaded up aircraft, uh, Cheetah D, with weapons. Now, okay, so this is a whole bunch of different uh, ordnance on it, but I want to actually talk about the missiles. We spoke a bit about missiles earlier. Uh, this is the H4. Is that correct? Yeah, it's the Raptor, it's Donnell's Raptor, a okay. smart weapon, uh, not going to give you the figures, but uh, sure, sure. from high altitude, you can get uh, in excess of 130 nautical miles and you can, you know, the, the point I must make maybe is that mankind learned the art of killing, unfortunately, and did not learn the art of building up. So when it says, come and let us uh, destroy something, the engineers are hugely capable at some devious designs and very accurate. And you can put a modern weapon through the glass window of a building over in excess of 130 nautical miles with today's weaponry. Wow. And this is, this is one of them. It's got its own, it's basically a kamikaze uh, drone, if you want to call it that. It's got its own motor. It's got its own wings that unfold once you release it, and it flies to the target with inertial nav and its own uh, navigation system, midlife updates and mid, mid course updates and things like that. Okay, it sounds like a highly technical thing, and I know you mentioned figures in the order of a, a million odd rand. Uh, sorry, that was the the, the, the drone. Uh, are these yeah. also in that kind of order of cost? The, this year is a, is a snake missile. This particular shot year was at the, actually at TFDC's fly-in in 2007, where the last of the V3S uh, air-to-air missiles were going to be um, shot off at uh, Two Squadrons Weapons Camp. And uh, what better place to do it in front of a few thousand people mm. watching the air show. The Army fired up a flare target and we fired these two missiles at minimum time interval and we took out the flares. We were hoping that in the next war we would be fighting against flares. Okay, well, I remember I was at that air show. It was a, it was a good day. And, um, but t talk a little bit about firing missiles. There's a shot here again of you having your fl fired your 50th missile. And I know you ended your career in the order of close to 70 missile firings, which around the world is quite an impressive feat. What is it, um, you know, in, in terms of firing missiles, the, the test capability or the, the requirement of the, the pilot to, to evaluate it? Because there's lots of test pilots and there's lots of military test pilots, but not all of them get to fire missiles either. So is there, is there a specific need or requirement or training that you need to be involved in firing missiles or that you can get to be involved in firing missiles? No, not at all. It's once again being at the right place at the right time. And I was at the right place at the right time. You, you see, life is about choices. And if you don't make the choices, somebody else makes them for you. And I sacrificed quite a lot to remain flying until the, the day I, they kicked me out the cockpit. But uh, I happened to be at Flight Test Center at a time in South Africa when the industry was peaking and there was a huge requirement for testing. So anybody can do that. you just got to be at the right place at the right time. Okay. But missile testing itself has its own particular challenges. Um, the plume from the missile, the hot gas is passing through the engine. And in some cases, depending on the flow field around the aircraft nose, the missile can sometimes cut in in front of you. And, you know, it's doing Mach 2 by the time it passes the cockpit. Wow. And... Uh, but, and it cuts across your nose, but it looks like it's going to take your nose off. But in fact, it has passed several feet ahead of the, the nose of the aircraft. Why, why does it cut across the nose? It's just got to do with the, the different uh, effects of the missile stability, the aircraft interaction, the flow field around the wing, and as it comes off the rails. 
Okay. Uh, this is for the very lightweight missiles, which the V3 series was. But when you get to the bigger missiles, uh, they don't have this problem. They just thunder on. <laughs> okay. They come uh, off and they smoke like all, and uh, away they go. All right. And here is a, another sort of a gunshot cam. Uh, or, or sorry, this is a telemetry cam from the, the base station at TFTC. Is that right? Yeah. This is the Oberberg test range. Okay. And these are what we call boosted bombs. You know that fighter pilots are not the bravest guys in the world. They want to go to a, they never go to a, a gunfight with a knife. <laughs> okay. So in this particular case, you remember in the beginning I told you that one way of ingressing a target area and getting out the other side is at 50 foot and at 500 knots. Yeah. Uh, you're going to beat the the defences, the ground defences, air defences, and if your if your navigation is accurate, you're going to hit the target. Now the other way is to stand off, to run in at low level, pitch and then toss the bomb. Okay. And what our engineers did, once again, devious as they were, they designed rocket motors, which they fitted into the back of the bomb. So the profile would be at low level, at, uh, you'd run at uh, 200 foot, accelerate to 540 knots, pitch to 45 degrees, and at 45 degrees, you just pickle the bombs, and off they go. They fly. And on their way up, these motors ignite, and they push the bomb on to the target area. And we were able to get about 16 kilometers out of these bombs. In the meantime, you've pulled up and you've uh, reversed at the top and you're heading away from the target area. The bombs fly towards the target. Okay. Many of these bombs would have um, time delays on them. So you could deny an area, you saturate an airfield with these things with time delays. Nobody would be able to move on that airfield uh, while all those, they didn't know what the time delays were on the various bombs. Are you saying they would hit the target like going to the ground or something would not explode yet? Yep. Oh, yep. wow. Okay, that sounds and quite high tech. So they were, the accuracy was about, uh, this, what we call the circular error probability was about 100 meters from uh, 16 kilometers which is very, very accurate. Wow. And in many cases, you would release the bombs in uh, auto mode, where the navigation system will decide uh, when they can go. Okay, that sounds fascinating. Now, uh, to, to just bring it all back in together here, I know we've, I've taken a lot of your time today. So here's a, a shot of your TFTC team with the F1 with the snake. And, and, and just to highlight the point of, of, um, of the teamwork required, you mentioned it's not just the one or two people uh, what are some of the key roles that make this high performance deliver and how do they, how is the interaction, where is the sort of focus on, on making sure that the team get the results? Obviously there's a lot of preparation, you have to do your job as diligently as possible, but there's also the debrief and, and talk about the sort of the interplay with those three aspects making this a success. Okay, so first of all, all the people on your team are highly competent. They also have what we call the wingman's contract, and they trust that everybody else in the team is going to make the, do the best that they can. There'll be no half jobs done, nobody slouching, and nobody not participating. Me as the leader of the team, I have guys there from telemetry. I have guys from flight test instrumentation, data acquisition. I have aircraft technicians, safety. Um, I have, uh, let me see who else. I have armorers, lots of armorers standing on the side there. I have the aircraft technicians, as I mentioned. Even the draftsman who, who helped with the design of the pylon is part of this team. Everybody participates in all the planning, and we go through what we call safety review boards, where we walk through the test plan of who's going to be doing what exactly, when, where, and how. So each, it's like a big orchestra. Everyone knows what role they must play, when they must play, and if one of them should, for whatever reason, not uh, perform, there would be somebody there understanding the big picture and be able to uh, fix the, the whatever problem it is that existed. So it's a, a very important. This is what I call a highly reliable organization. You call it a team in your, <laughs> but this year it's an organization of, uh, because besides all of this, there's the people on the Overberg test range side who are sitting down. They're not in this picture. 
that are going to man the CINE theodolites, the tracking radars, and do all the data reduction and data analysis, and particularly home in on what happens to that missile when it comes off the rails. What type of separation are we getting? What has happened to the plume? In this particular case here, the compounds in the back of that missile eat into the metal of the leading edge of this, on the slats oh, wow. of this Mirage F1. So after we'd fired the first missile, I told you, <laughs> sure. we're working with the unknown. Sure. We burnt the whole uh, front end, uh, not badly, hmm. but we had to find a fix with heat-resistant paints and with tapes to prevent damage to, if you had to do this, you pit the, the metal due to the uh, chemical content that is in the pyrotechnics. Wow, it sounds interesting. I mean, the, the working with the unknowns, and uh, certainly there's a, there's way more unknowns in, in test flying and uh, missile testing and, and fighter aircraft, etc. Um, before we wrap up, I want to just leave uh, one more question and, and we can morph into to your current project. Uh, one of the points that you mentioned in your highly reliable organization, your high performance team, is that skills decay is inevitable, and you need to design the train training accordingly. Uh, I don't know if that can speak to your current book and you can share a little bit about what you're currently busy with now and, and how it will relate. But if you want to just talk to us a little bit about this, how would you design training accordingly? Considering we're in this situation now, I'm sitting with a license that has lapsed at the end of March and I've been given a revalidation, uh, uh, an extension just because of COVID-19. So yeah. where would this uh, designing train, training accordingly to prevent skills decay? And uh, if you want to just share a bit about your new book. All right, so I've, I've, I was actually approached by the International Council of Airshows and the European Airshow Council and also Airshow South Africa to look at. I previously published a book many years ago called Zero Error Margin, which uh, came about when uh, Mike Beachy had established that Thunder City. Mm -hmm. And he bought all those aircraft and they all wanted to do uh, aerobatics and fly at airshows and they didn't know how to go about it. So they convinced me to write this book called Zero Era Margin. Subsequently, I was approached uh, internationally to bring out a, an updated version. So I have uh, written a book called The Anatomy of Airshow Accidents. It's with the International Council of Airshows at the moment for publication. Uh, it should have been published in December. It's still not published yet. And uh, therein it looks at a large percentage of the research is done on human physiology for us that do fly in the highly uh, high risk environment of low level aerobatics, you know as well as I, there are no second chances, there's zero error margin. And uh, it would take us another day to go through what I've <laughs> discovered. I, I'm not a psychologist, I just know that in my total career, and I still fly at the age of 70, casting 71, that I'm the weakest link in the safety chain. And there are things that happen in our bodies. There are chemicals that are activated through the environmental, uh, in the, through the environment, which determine our stress levels, which determine how much adrenaline, how much dopamine, all of these different chemicals mm. get activated by our bodies. The things that we reflect on as nervousness, for instance, Nobody's ever taught me about that. I've had to go and study all of this mm. to find out why I behave like I do. And if I know all of this, it helps me that when I have to make a decision that I am not going to, I'm going to have a better informed decision. How do I control my ego? And mm. all these different aspects of uh, my physiology that m keeps me as a safe pilot. And I want to emphasize once again, I am here by the grace of God. I have made mistakes like you cannot believe, and I still make them. Sometimes I get things wrong. Mostly I get them right. Um, so your question was, how about training? Yeah, the skills so decay. Now, yeah. Skills decay. You've got four months. You've been flying. I've had a few. Luckily, I've got a few flights that I've flown in the last while. But my colleagues now are saying to me, how are we going to go about this? We're going to go and fly again in four months' time. So I've got to go and sit down, and I've got to approach my flight as I do in test flying, as I would do a first flight. Okay. So when we do first flight in test flying, 
there's a process. You don't just get in, start the engine and go. <laughs> sure. There's the preparation. There's the, the quizzes, understanding all of the systems. And also understanding that I have a basic skill set which is there. It's, and I must not be uh, have any doubts in my mind. My capabilities, my fine motor skills have not gone. Mm. My judgment skills are what worry me now. Am I going to make the right decision? Because I know the basics are still there. Energy management and how, to, how much rudder to apply. In the beginning, I'm going to be a little bit... Um, what would you call it? Uh, a little bit. Your scan rate will be a bit slow. <laughs> scan rate on the instruments, the touch, the feel of the mm. aircraft. You see, an aircraft is like your wife or your girlfriend or vice versa. If you want to know how the aircraft is doing, you need to touch it. So when you fly, and each aircraft has its own modal characteristics, if you can call it that. Yeah. It requires certain rates of input. Some aircraft, you can put full rudder on immediately. Others, you need to touch it, feel it. And the combination between the control harmony, between pitch, roll, and yaw. So you've got to first go and feel your aircraft and get used to it. You haven't been with her for a long time. So you need to conduct exercise. So I typically, for instance, would spend time on focusing on because I know I'm going to be slow, and you know as well as I, the regulations say two-second time interval, I'm going to respond to emergency. Bullshit. It's not going to happen. At this stage, I'm calculating for me at least five seconds to get the startle effect mm -hmm. and to say, uh-uh, something is wrong. What is it? All of those things where I was flying every day, those things have now slip by after four months. So mm -hmm. I'm going to get airborne and I'm going to concentrate on engine failure after takeoff. You people don't have that problem, but in me flying a single engine airplane, serious problem. I'm going to spend time doing horizontal figures of eights at a constant speed and then move it into the vertical figures of eights because that gives you the best feel for the response of the aircraft. And then I'm going to do things like short period oscillations. I'm going to excite the short period of the aircraft and see how she responds. I'm going to look at long period. And then I'm going to do some, uh, come back and do uh, circuits and landings, focusing on energy management uh, so that I don't get lost out in the corner, losing energy on final approach. So those are the type of exercises I would do. Before the time, I would treat the aircraft as a simulator. I'll do a blindfold copper check, and I will do uh, go through. I will make the aircraft my simulator. I'm going to go for each of engine failure, uh, alternate fuel tank, fuel pump on, that type of thing. Where's the throttle? Where's the pitch? Where's the mixture? I'm talking about things that you've forgotten about <laughs> long ago. But there are us downstairs that still fly these aeroplanes. Okay. So it becomes a bit of a challenge for us. Okay. Well, that's a wonderful, and, and you're right, we could talk for hours on this. It's a, that's a wonderful way to summarize the sort of the, the dedication you need to put in to keep your skill shop knowing that there's been this long yep. break and uh, yep. you know we don't know how long it's going to last that um, that some people might not fly for another few months still yep Quite general right. it's been wonderful talking to you and uh, the, the the snippet that you've shared with me about your book i'm really looking forward to it uh, how far away is this from being available to the public well it could be as uh, i'm waiting for the council of air shows and if they don't publish it within the next uh, day or three i'm going to go it alone okay but they want they've established what is called an international air show safety team. It's a virtual body that includes all the countries in the world where they're going to try to put some form of common regulation so the, and sharing of experiences to cut the number, the loss rate that we have annually. And uh, so if they don't get going and they wanted to use this as the book, as, as their platform to launch with, okay. and that's what they're waiting for. Oh, well, that sounds exciting. I'll look, uh, I'll look out for it and uh, wait for the, the publication and some information. Thank you so much for your time, General. Appreciate it. And uh, the listeners have Roger, lots, of, lots of good comments saying thank you. Uh, appreciate your time and take care for the rest of the okay. lockdown. Good. Roger. Thank you very much. Go away. Well, thanks, everybody. It's been a wonderful conversation. I appreciate you joining. Remember to, to subscribe, to share, to uh, pass on the good message. And until next time. Tomorrow evening, remember, 6 o'clock, we have Beast and Tarira from the Springboks World Cup winning uh, team of last year's Rugby World Cup. Stay oh. safe.
Shame.